Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Marco Lloyd, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host a litigation update on Heil v. Michigan, featuring Tim Rosenberger. Mr. Mr. Rosenberger is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and Stanford University's Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. He is also the founding COO of Verbum Labs and serves as a chaplain of the Cleveland Division of Police. He is a frequent contributor to academic, popular, and professional publications, and has testified before state legislatures and filed dozens of amicus briefs in the Supreme Court and various circuit courts. If you would like to learn more about today's speaker, his full bio can be viewed on our website, bedsock.org. After our speaker gives his remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question at any point in today's program, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can towards the end of our program. Finally, I'll note that as always, the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues, and all expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. With that, Mr. Rosenberger, thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Marco, and thank you to the Federal Society for hosting a discussion of this, I think somewhat under the radar, but really important case. Um, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and for those of you who are like me out here in California or on the West Coast, uh, good morning. As Marco said, I'm a legal policy fellow at the Manhattan Institute and um, I'm excited to be the one to walk you through this case in which we filed an amicus brief. Uh, this case addresses critical issues concerning religious liberty and school choice. And we're going to sort of, um, you know, provide a detailed background and walk through. I'm sure some folks will find this a little repetitive, uh, but I know that sometimes when I join these, I'm not totally right in on the case. So I'm going to give you the sort of background uh, I would enjoy as a viewer. So the plaintiffs in this case, uh, the named plaintiff is a woman, a mother named Jill Heil, are a group of parents from various regions across the state of Michigan who are seeking to use state-provided educational vouchers and 529 savings plans to fund their children's attendance at religious schools. Um, these parents are organized under an organization called Parent Advocates for Choice, uh, the PACE Foundation. And these parents are spread across the state of Michigan. So this isn't you know, just people in Detroit or people out in some rural county. You have people from Wayne, you have people from Oakland, you have people from Kent. Uh, and so, it really is a coalition that reflects sort of the geographic uh, diversity and sort of different cultural locations in the state of Michigan, but they're united by a broad desire to provide their children with religious education that aligns with their beliefs. Central to this case is Michigan's Blaine Amendment. And uh, as I'm sure we'll discuss further uh, in my remarks, and I imagine also in the questions, there's some question about whether this is properly understood as a Blaine Amendment. Um, my, my understanding, and, and that the one that we took in our brief, is that it pretty transparently is a Blaine Amendment for several reasons, uh, but, but there, is, there is some sort of factual oddity here. So Michigan's Blaine Amendment has been part of their state's constitution since 1970. Uh, it states that no public money or property shall be appropriated or paid to aid or maintain any private denominational or other non-public school. Uh, this amendment reflects a historical trend aimed at preventing public funds from supporting religious and particularly Catholic schools. Uh, but again, you'll note this one's passed in 1970, which is a good ways later than when we see most states adopting their Blaine Amendments. The Blaine Amendment in Michigan has been a persistent barrier for parents like Jill Heil and her co-plaintiffs who wish to utilize public funds for religious education. This matter came to more of a head after the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, as many of you probably know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, implicated 529 educational savings plans. And these plans are named after Section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code, and they're tax advantage savings plans designed to encourage savings for future education costs. Now, parents, uh, you know, the, the sort of conventional parent uh, may use these to start saving early for college, given its astronomical cost. 
but these funds can also be used for private parochial education in theory. Um, and so the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017 uh, expanded the use of 529 plans to include up to 10,000 per year per student for tuition at private K-12 schools, including religious schools. Uh, as you can imagine, particularly for families of faith who often have several children, uh, the tax implications of this can be quite significant. So it's 10,000 per student per year you can go into this 529 plan. The plaintiffs in Heil sought to use their 529 plans to fund their children's tuition at religious schools. However, due to Michigan's Blaine Amendment, they were prohibited from doing so. The state does not allow uh, parents, or did not allow parents, to use their 529 plan funds for religious schools. This restriction, the plaintiffs argued, infringed upon their First Amendment rights by discriminating against religious options in the school choice landscape. As this case moved forward, uh, the state took various steps to moot that 529 issue. So in response to the lawsuit, Michigan amended its policies to allow 529 plan funds to be used for tuition at private religious schools. This action was intended to address the plaintiff's claims regarding the use of 529 plans and to remove what was probably the most significant aspect of their legal challenge. Uh, fortunately for us to be able to discuss this here today, the plaintiffs continued their lawsuit by shifting their focus to the broader issue of Michigan's Blaine Amendment and its prohibition on using any public funds, including vouchers for religious schools. So they initially filed, uh, obviously, in district court. Um, they challenged the Blaine Amendment's prohibition on using public funds for religious schools, and they argued that this prohibition violated their rights under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. After the state's actions to moot uh, the 529 issue, um, they, they sort of narrowed what was, what was continuing and the federal district court ruled against them, uh, stating that the Blaine Amendment was legitimate exercise of the state's authority to maintain a separation between church and state. The court emphasized that the amendment applied equally to all religious institutions and did not target any specific denomination. Um, and again, that's important because a big part of the fact base here is the historically anti-Catholic animus that seems to drive the passage of Blaine Amendments and that could be uh, sort of specifically shown out in the various Michigan um, efforts to initially pass the Blaine Amendment in 1970 and then to keep it in 2000. Uh, Michigan sort of has this interesting fact pattern where it does have a non-trivial number of non Catholic schools, particularly Lutheran schools. And so the fact that these schools also uh, are denied funding under this Blaine Amendment, uh, the court you know, examined or, or seems to have considered in relation to pushing back on uh, the, the pretty clear fact basis of anti-Catholic animus. The parents then took their case to the Sixth, sixth Circuit. Uh, in their appeal, they argued that the district court failed to adequately consider the broader implications of Michigan's Blaine Amendment and the implications of this amendment on uh, the parents and their families' religious freedoms, parental rights, and in particular, substantive due process rights. They maintained that the amendment's prohibition on using vouchers for religious schools was discriminatory and violated their constitutional rights. We saw some interesting things come up in oral argument. Uh, there was at least one sort of lengthy and a, a few allusions to uh, the history of anti-Catholic animus as specifically concerned Michigan and as specifically concerned the passage of uh, the 1970 amendment and then its retention in 2000. This key issue raised was the historical context of whether it was rooted in anti-Catholic animus. Uh, the plaintiffs emphasize the amendment's origins and the discriminatory, discriminatory intent behind its enactment. And they pre presented pretty compelling evidence of anti-Catholic sentiment that was prevalent around the 1970 passage and sort of made explicit in the campaign in 2000. Uh, the judges questioned the relevance of that historical animus in evaluating the current constitutionality of the amendment. Probe, and they probed whether past discriminatory motives should affect the interpretation and application of the law today. 
there's a really interesting exchange where the state says, well, the amendment specifically doesn't concern transportation. So uh, public funds could be used for transportation to a private school. Uh, this would include a Catholic school. And so if you really had this deep anti-Catholic sentiment, if you really had this deep animus for people uh, of Catholic faith or more broadly Christian faith, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't allow for funding of transportation. You would block that too. And, and so this, this tiny area where funding is allowed is somehow evidence uh, that undercuts the claims of broad anti-Catholic sentiment. There was then a discussion about uh, facial neutrality versus discriminatory impact. And the state's council argued that their Blaine Amendment is facially neutral. Uh, it prohibits public funding for all private schools, both religious and secular. Uh, plaintiffs wisely countered that facial neutrality there does not negate its discriminatory impact on religious schools or on the parents who choose religious education. The judges explored the tension between facial neutrality and discriminatory impact. And they asked whether a law that appears neutral on its face can still be unconstitutional if it disproportionately affects uh, this particular Catholic group. And um, you know their, their decision sort of explains where they come out on this, but uh, in, in the argument, this was something that seemed like they wanted to spend a bit more time on, but uh, more time bound and, and didn't quite get as deep into as one might have hoped. They also spent more time than I might have expected looking at policy objectives. Uh, the plaintiffs highlighted the conflict between federal policy objectives uh, within that 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and uh, the state's Blaine Amendment. So the federal government passes this Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It says you can spend 10,000 per student per year on uh, K-12 education. These parents want to spend that money at a religious school and now they're uh, being undercut by the state of Michigan. The judges questioned how to reconcile the conflicting policies. Michigan's desire to keep money out of private schools and sort of this obvious federal effort to push money into private schools and to sort of encourage school choice. Um, they were wading through federalism principles and the autonomy of states to set their own educational funding rules. And they had a discussion that focused on whether federal policy changes should influence the interpretation and application of a state constitutional provision. There was also a part of the oral argument dedicated to plaintiff's political process theory. And so the plaintiffs argued that Michigan's Blaine Amendment places an unconstitutional burden on religious persons by making it harder for them to lobby for state government aid. The state argued that the political process doctrine should not be extended beyond racial discrimination cases. And they questioned its applicability to religious discrimination cases. The judges debated the viability and scope of the political process doctrine, considering whether it could apply to other forms of discrimination and the implications of expanding that doctrine uh, explicitly to include religious plaintiffs similar to those in this case. On the topic of standing and injury, the state challenged the plaintiff's standing, arguing that they had not adequately demonstrated a concrete injury, particularly after the state's actions mooted the sort of core issue, which is again, this 529 issue. Now, the plaintiffs contend that they had suffered tangible injury by being unable to use their 529 plans for religious school tuition without incurring tax penalties and by being disadvantaged in the political process. The judges delved into the specifics of standing requirements, discussing what constitutes a concrete injury and whether the plaintiffs had sufficient pledge to have uh, shown such an injury. And then there's this discussion of the potential broader impact. So both sides, of course, wanted to point to a broader impact of the court's decision. And the plaintiffs argued that a ruling in, in their favor could lead to greater educational freedom in the state. Uh, the state warned that the potential consequence uh, of a ruling against the state would be uh, an undercutting of the public school funding within the state of Michigan. The judges considered the implications of their ruling for other states with similar Blaine amendments and the broader landscape of school choice and religious liberty in the US. So the Sixth Circuit then uh, comes out with a decision and um, they, they walk us through the background enactment of the Michigan's Blaine Amendment. They look at it being passed in 1970. They talk about how it um, bars appropriation to any private school, denominational or otherwise. 
and they 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 take seriously in a way the plaintiff's uh, argument that this is rooted in anti-Catholic animus, and and they give some treatment to the historical documents and public statements from the time. Um, but but they come down and they say, uh, you know, the, this amendment because it's in 1970, it's much later. Uh, this is a law that's responding to a 1970 law that allowed the Department of Education to purchase educational services from non-public schools in secular subjects. And uh, the, this federal law was going to primarily benefit religious schools, in particular Catholic ones. And this is uh, the milieu in which, which Michigan enacts this Blaine Amendment. It then deals with the 2000 election reauthorization. So again, in 2000, Michigan voters reject a ballot initiative that would have amended uh, that 1970 Blaine Amendment to allow indirect support of non-public schools through a voucher program. Uh, the plaintiffs didn't spend so much time with uh, the anti-religious animus during this election, but the state used this 2000 election to affirmatively argue that uh, it, it was an affirmation of the 1970 amendment and that that affirmation in 2000, uh, untainted by the same anti-Catholic animus, uh, somehow cleansed the 1970 amendment of um, you know this this grim history. The plaintiffs brought multiple claims, and and this included three free exercise claims, one equal protection claim. They focused their appeal on that equal protection claim based on the political process theory, and uh, specifically this thing about lobbying the inability or the impediment to lobbying the government for aid. Uh, the court was concerned about standing, and they examined uh, whether the plaintiffs had standing to bring their claims. It's noted the, the lack of specificity in what the plaintiffs alleged, and, and the court makes a great point of, you know, these plaintiffs uh, share Catholic or sort of imply that they share uh, Catholic faith, but they don't explicitly say that they are Catholics and that they would use this money to attend a Catholic school. Um, that said, is that the plaintiffs had adequately alleged a concrete injury uh, caused by the amendment and that they had satisfied the standing requirements. Um, as concerns the political process doctrine, uh, the court noted the political process doctrine had not been applied outside the context of racial discrimination and questioned its viability after the Supreme Court's decision in Schutte, um, which took a narrow view of the doctrine. And so, uh, Sort of within the broader religious liberty milieu, within the broader school choice milieu. This is an important thing. The Sixth Circuit has teed up the opportunity to expand this political process doctrine to cover uh, allegations of religious discrimination as well as racial discrimination, and they choose not to do that. And I think this is something that we expect, um, you know, in this case or another case is something the Supreme Court is going to have to visit again. The court, again, really interested in the facial neutrality uh, of legitimate policy choice. They emphasized the facial neutrality of Michigan's Blaine Amendment, and they rejected the plaintiff's argument that the amendment was motivated by anti-religious bias. Um, and they, they specifically point to a Michigan Supreme Court decision that the proposal was not enacted with anti-religious animus. Um, sh should they have sort of taken that, taken that face value? I, I don't think so, but they did. The court uh, sort of agrees with the state that the 2000 election has some uh, impact. They uh, agree with the state that this 2000 election purged any alleged taint of anti-religious animus. And they point to Supreme Court precedent establishing that later reauthorization of the law can cleanse it of any discriminatory purpose from its original enactment. And so ultimately, the Sixth Circuit uh, pushes aside plaintiff's claims here and um, they 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 do they do uh, agree that the plaintiffs have standing, but they don't uh, overturn this Michigan amendment, and uh, they're sort of unmoved by the political process argument. So we filed uh, a amicus brief alongside the cert petition, and there were several things that we looked at in our brief. Uh, this was a brief that I wrote alongside Ilya Shapiro, our director of constitutional studies and Nicole Garnett uh, from Notre Dame, who is also a senior fellow at MI. The first thing we wanted to look at was federalism and parental choice. Our brief emphasized that the federal government exp 
government's expansion of the 529 plans under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was specifically intended to give parents greater flexibility in choosing the best educational environment for their children, including religious schools. There really is this uh, conflict between what the federal government is sort of going for and what Michigan's uh, constitution would, uh, would allow. And that's, that's going to have to be had out in some way. Uh, we argue that by prohibiting the use of educational vouchers for religious schools, Michigan's Blaine Amendment is directly undermining a federal policy objective and it's restricting parental choice. We also looked at economic impact and education outcomes. And you know, our brief and, and others made this point as well. Um, barring parents from using their educational vouchers and or 529 plans for religious schools um, reduces you know, the broad benefits of school choice. You don't have this opportunity for schools to compete. We know that when there is competition between the income and public schools and uh, non-public options, uh, that there's an improvement across the board. There's sort of this competition. And that particularly for the students who would have the opportunity to select a voucher or to have their parents pay for school under a 529 plan, um, there's a, a reduced outcome. We also showed evidence suggesting that increased competition uh, fosters innovation within education. And we also looked at how school choice programs broadly correlate with higher academic achievement and increased parental satisfaction. I think the most important work we did here was the historical and constitutional context. We provide a historical overview of Blaine Amendments. We look at their origins in 19th century anti-Catholic sentiment. Michigan really hangs its hat on our amendment comes from 1970. We are not like these other states that more than 100 years ago had deep anti-Catholic bigotry and passed laws uh, designed particularly to harm or limit potential benefit to uh, Catholic people and Catholic schools. And we show how this 1970 amendment is very similar to the older Blaine amendments that other states enact earlier. Um, we look at the milieu of religious bigotry that provides the template for these amendments. And um, we show that Michigan's Blaine amendment, though it might be facially neutral, is part of this broader historical context of religious discrimination. We also looked at some of the modern Supreme Court jurisprudence, cases like Trinity Lutheran, um, that increasingly recognize the rights of religious institutions to participate in public benefit programs on equal footing with sec secular institutions. We examine how uh, Michigan's Blaine Amendment violates the Equal Protection Clause. Um, we also look at it's sort of entanglement, or entanglement spread the wrong word, how uh, it implicates the free exercise clause. And we argued that the court should recognize that discrimination cannot be justified by a state's interest in maintaining a strict separation of church and state, especially when such separation imposes significant burdens on religious exercise. We also wanted to look at the broader implications, and that's something that I think is why we're all here uh, on this call. We warned about how the decision to uphold Michigan's Blaine Amendment would seem to set a precedent for other states with similar amendments. And this also would provide sort of a guide to states on how they can pass new purportedly facially neutral amendments that in some way undercut uh, the free expression of religion and religious communities. If this amendment stands, we do think it's going to be a key sort of disappointing turning point in a moment where we see more and more respect for and protection of religious freedom. Uh, if, if this Michigan amendment is allowed to stand, one sort of expects uh, states that are less enthused about uh, religious freedom to see it as a guide to how they can enact their policy uh, goals and in some way undercut people of faith. And we argue that striking down this amendment would promote greater educational freedom and benefit society by ensuring that all parents, regardless of religious beliefs, have equal access to public education benefits. And again, I think this points to a broader trend. We see a movement nationwide towards school choice. And uh, it, we could sort of see this as the turning point, uh, the, the moment where things slow. Um, you know, less essential to this 
the specific facts of this case. We didn't go way deep into it, but one can imagine uh, sort of the cabal of anti-school choice entities um, seeing this as a guide to how they can use friendly states to halt the advance of school choice in their states. So thank you uh, for listening to my sort of detailed uh, guide walk through this case. Um, we, we think it's a really important one, both for the religious liberty movement and for the school choice movement. And I'm excited to hear what questions you have, because I'm hoping we have folks who are uh, working on these issues on the call. So back to you, Marco. Well, thank you so much for that fantastic overview. Um, and we'll now turn to the audience for questions. Um, if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, to kick us off, if you were to engage in wild speculation, um, what do you think is the likelihood of the Supreme Court um, granting cert? Well, I'm very bad at this, right? I, I'm very bad at uh, sort of predicting things um, in the political and court realm. So we really probably should, should have Ilya for this question. Uh, I guess what I would say is I don't have a sense. Um, I don't know that they're going to take this specific case because some of the facts are so weird. You have this uh, Blaine Amendment that comes quite late, 1970. You have uh, the main issue of the case, the 529, um, the 529 benefit sort of being mooted. Um, I, I think there are still important issues here. I think they st should still take it, but I think the, the sort of factual position of it is a little strange. They may not choose to. That being said, I think the broader issues here are going to have to be had out in the Supreme Court relatively soon. I know our uh, general view as Federalists as well, you know, the court, the court should generally uh, stay out of things and let legislatures deal with them. But I think we've seen again and again, there's sort of this, uh, it's almost a Sorosian reflexivity between legislatures and the courts. You have sort of the societal movement towards something. And um, it's, it's very unusual, actually, that the court is able to wait it out, right? You, you see this in gay marriage. You see this in uh, the sort of reversal of Roe. You see it in other things where sort of the societal consensus is moving is moving in a new direction and the legislatures are sort of haltingly moving there. And um, eventually something happens that forces the courts to get into it. And so, as I said towards the end of my remarks, you see these sort of two big slow moving waves. Uh, one is one that says, you know, we're going to take religious freedom a lot more seriously and we're going to do what the constitution says about protection of religious freedom. And you see this, slowly moving. Uh, and at the same time, you see this movement of school choice. Uh, it's one of these few things that does have sort of bipartisan support. Uh, it's not full bipartisan support. It's just pieces of different coalitions. But it's now a decided majority of folks think, you know, we probably should have school choice. Uh, we can kind of sense that the motivations against school choice are like not real non-self-interested motives. It does really feel like the anti-school choice lobby is uh, sort of a protectionist thing for teachers unions um, and maybe maybe for some sort of lefty indoctrination. And we don't really want this thing. So we're going to eventually have school choice and you see it moving sort of haltingly. And so I imagine within the next couple of terms, the court's going to have to take a case similar to this one on uh, the religious, religious liberty issue, specifically as concerns uh, whether, whether to expand this political uh, question thing. And I think we expect to see them take some cases of about uh, that in some way implicate school choice. Um, I think they should just do it now, right? I, I sort of a maximalist view of what, what should happen with this case, but um, it remains to be seen. So I guess I would, I would come out sort of 60, 40, they don't take this case, but you know, that's sort of a lame answer to your core question, which is uh, what's gonna happen. John Scheller asks, in light of Zellman, Trinity Lutheran, Espinoza, and Carson, uh, it, it seems obvious, obvious that Heil must win in the land side. Why is that incorrect? Or what is different um, between the facts of those? Yeah, I mean, one, um, the court has to take it, right? And, and, and so I'm not, not certain they do that. Um, 
Two, you know, there's this facial neutrality. So they, they, Michigan can really point to, we aren't giving any benefit to a private school either. And, um, you know, I, I think Michigan can say with a straight face that uh, the, the sort of uncharitable version is we want to keep as much money in our public schools as possible. You know, this isn't an anti-religious thing. It is a, you know, we have, we're a blue state. Uh, we have strong unions. Uh, we want unionized teachers to get this money. And that's what it's really about. I don't, I don't think they're going to, you know, come out and say that, but I, I think that's sort of under the surface here, but it really isn't uh, an anti-religious thing. And again, on the core issue that got these, got these parents to show up, uh, 5.9, like, you know, Michigan, Michigan sort of rolled over on that. So does the court really want to get into this weird case, um, TBD? You happen to know off the top of your head what portion of non-public schools in Michigan are religious? Um, and then a follow-up to that, um, would non-public schools be a proxy for religious schools, or is that an oversimplification? Yeah, so... I don't know off the top of my head. I guess we can sort of think through this anecdotally, right? Like my, my old hat was uh, as a management consultant. If you were thinking of this as like a management consultancy, um, like logic game, you would say, well, you know, what do I know about Michigan? I know that Michigan has a lot of Catholics. So they probably have a lot of Catholic schools. Uh, and I know that I actually know that they have a lot of uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans. So I know they have like a lot of Missouri Synod Lutheran schools relative to other states, right? They're probably a top five state for that. Uh, I also know that they have a very large Muslim community. And I, I don't know how many schools they have set up, but I know that the Muslim community probably is no less excited or no more excited about what's happening in uh, you know Detroit area public schools than Catholics or Lutherans. So I imagine that if they had money, if they don't have schools now, uh, if if Michigan put in a voucher program and said, "Hey, we'll give you money to send your kid to a, a Islamic school," they would they would jump at that. So um, I, I can think of all of these constituencies that would want a religious school. And then if I think about, well, what are you know other private schools? Um, you know, when I when I think of private schools, I think of you know big cities in the U.S. as having probably a you know a non sectarian again a word we're not, we're not going to use because non sectarian sort of gloss for we don't like the Catholics, but you know a, a secular private school, big cities. So Detroit probably has a couple. Um, can't think of anywhere else, right? Like it wouldn't surprise me if Ann Arbor has one, but uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if really anywhere else in Michigan had a uh, secular private school. And so, yeah, I, I think we can sort of reason out that the vast majority of them are religious. Um, to part two of your question, is that too simple of a gloss? Um, I mean, again, as applies to the state of Michigan, Probably not. And as applies to the history of this particular amendment, you know, 1970, like the same year, the federal government says, hey, if you want to use money to purchase services from private religious schools for non-religious things, that's just fine. Michigan, all of a sudden, after, you know, 100 years of not following other states and passing a blame amendment, races this one across the finish line. I think it's pretty clear uh, based on that, that this was about religious schools, um, that it is about religious schools. Um, but, but again, you know, it is written in a way that is facially neutral. Like it does not uh, extend a benefit to non-religious private schools. And, you know, the Sixth Circuit says that's good enough. Um, I'm, I'm unconvinced. And I, I hope that, you know, on this case or another one, uh, the Supreme Court weighs in. Um, Robert Fitzpatrick asks, um, is there a role for looking at disparate impact um, in this case? I need a smaller question, Robert. I'm sorry. Can we go to the next one and then come back to that one? Um, like, I would say yes, but I know that's not much of an answer, so I, I'm not quite sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, Paul Stankowitz asks, um, you mentioned that Michigan can use their 529 funds for private K-12 tuition, but that would forfeit state tax benefits, correct? Yeah, that is my understanding of it. Sarah, we can check that. I actually really should know that answer. Uh, Pat, I think the way you just represented it is correct, but like we should double check because I'm, I'm not totally sure. 
there Reese asks, um, does the state actually have a school voucher program? No, Michigan doesn't have a voucher program um, right now, but you can see that sort of peer states do. So you, know, you look at Michigan uh, has a land border to the south with two states. Uh, one is my state of Ohio, universal vouchers. Uh, one is Indiana, vouchers for everyone except Nicole Garnett. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, that's the deal. So um, you can sort of see, you know, things move geographically. You know, it's actually interesting when you look at the Blaine Amendment, it has this move through the South, right? Unsurprisingly, right? The South uh, takes a dim view of Catholicism and uh, they put these Blaine Amendments in. So, um, and, and then it goes to, to many other places, but, you know, policy moves geographically in our country. Uh, Michigan is sort of culturally located in a, in a part of the country that is taking school choice really seriously. And um, one imagines the next time there is uh, a GOP government in Michigan that school choice is going to be a top priority for them. And so, you know, it's, it's really important for people who don't want school choice in Michigan to lay the groundwork now for, uh, you know, preserving this bar to private funding. And it's really important now for uh, people of faith who are going to want to use their, you know, any potential future voucher um, at a religious school to have that out now. I, I think that's a, a good thing for us to sort of work on now because, um, you know, at some point Michigan will have vouchers. Like, I, I think it's sort of an inevitability. Um, Palmer asks, um, um, how many states currently have Blaine amendments or Blaine amendment type um, legislation? Well, this is a hard one because many states have them um, and have not bothered to repeal them, but they are, are in effect dead. And so um, Professor Garnett and I did a report, which you can find on the Manhattan Institute's website, that is like a broad survey of ongoing um, state religious discrimination. And some of that is Blaine amendments. Uh, some of that is sort of goofy, weird laws, right? So uh, there's one state, I think it's Alabama, but we, you know, have to look at the report that says, um, if you're driving uh, like a minibus and you buy gas for that minibus, um, that's tax exempt because you're, you know, driving, driving multiple people in a minibus. Um, but not if you drive to a church, right? Then, then it's not tax exempt. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of, sort of these funny, goofy laws that uh, just target religious uh, communities. And um, so I'd point you to that report. Uh, if you email me, I'll get you the, the precise answer. But, um, you know, there, there is this weirdness of what do you count? Because, you know, you have a state like Michigan that has a Blaine Amendment and is going to court to enforce it. Uh, and then you have states that have Blaine Amendments that are, you know, uh, effectively dead. Carlos Daniels asks, are you starting to see other states pick up on this decision? I haven't seen that yet. Um, I think probably we're all waiting to see what the Supreme Court does. Uh, I think if either the Supreme Court takes this and, uh, and sides with Michigan or doesn't grant cert, I would expect uh, some states to view this as a template because I, I think it does do... Um, it does do some good work for some powerful constituencies. Um, but I, I haven't seen people pick this up yet. And, uh, you know, this is sort of very anecdotal, but you do get the sense that the fact that Michigan is going through this fight is now part of like this narrative course that says, if you are a pro-freedom state, if you're a pro-freedom uh, governor, then you should push through school choice, right? That's just part of the deal. I, I think you see this interesting thing that uh, seemingly unrelated things in the sort become sort of tied to identity and then get sorted out. And so people look at Michigan and they think, you know, Michigan sort of this goofily repressive Midwestern state that had, you know, crazy COVID lockdowns and was very sort of uh, anomalous relative to its neighbors in terms of the whole package of freedom sort of priorities, um, they're really going to go to bother, uh, they're really going to go to the Supreme Court over uh, this, this Blaine Amendment's funding religious schools. Well, that would suggest to us that we should do the exact opposite, right? We are a laggard pro-freedom state if we don't enact school choice. Um, so I do think you see some of that um, sort of 
cultural movement happening. Uh, and, and that may be sort of outside the scope of our courtroom update, but I do think it's important and sort of interesting to note. John Scheller asks, given the factual oddities in this case, do you know why they bypassed en banc review to go directly to the Supreme Court? Well, I, I don't uh, I don't think I have a better idea than you do, John. Um, yeah, I mean, no, I don't know. Um, I guess what was sort of surprising to me after listening to the oral arguments, looking at who the judges were on that panel, um, again, this is why maybe I'm, I'm just not very good at the predictive stuff. You know, I, I would have expected both based on who was on the panel and based on where the conversation went that, um, you know, if not a favorable decision from the Sixth Circuit, I would have expected uh, a more favorable one. Um, so, I think maybe they just said, well, you know, the, the sixth is not is not where we want to be. And I, I think you've also got to remember the Sixth Circuit is sort of a weird place. Um, it, it seems based on the appointees and based on, you know, there are a number of really great judges there that it would be a, a, um, a good place for a case like this. But uh, you, you sometimes see them not go the way you expect them to. Uh, to that point, John Engler asked, which judges were on the Sixth Circuit panel? Oh, I can look this up. I had this a second ago. <laughs> well, I did have this up, but I'm not, not seeing it right now. So, sorry, I'll have to get back to Governor. Would you mind um, expanding on what the school voucher ballot initiative in 2000 um, was and its bearing on this case? Yeah, so the school voucher ballot initiative in 2000 uh, was a case that was going to allow some uh, funding. And it, it was not a full repeal of the 1970 amendment, but it was going to allow some funding to go to private schools. Uh, and this is blown back, right? This uh, road was rejected. And so the state of Michigan argues, well, you know, you can show this history of anti-Catholic animus in 1970. Uh, you can show sort of that damning fact I pointed to earlier, where the federal government opens the door to the private contracting um, of educational services in 1970, including from religious schools. And then just like this, Michigan uh, passes this amendment, 1970. And the point to that, but then 2000, you, you don't quite have the same fact base, right? You, you don't have uh, as, as overt statements of anti-Catholic bigotry. You don't have quite the same uh, cultural milieu, right? You, you have sort of a uh, the religious right by 2000 has sort of embraced Catholics. They're part of the team. Uh, they're not this scary thing we need to keep out of our public schools. Instead, they're sort of allies in restoring sanity to our public schools. So sort of various things have changed by 2000. And therefore, this 2000 rejection of something similar but, but different from 1970 um, cleanses the 1970 amendment. Uh, so there's sort of two reasons why I, I don't think that works. Uh, and, and those, you know, you, you can see argued. The first is that, again, it's not, it's not a repeal of the 1970 amendment. It is a um, sort of reformation of that, that constitutional amendment that would allow for some limited funding. Um, the, second, the second issue is that, uh, you know, one, one has to ask whether uh, there really is this great, great cultural shift and uh, a warmer feeling towards people of faith, in particular Catholics, or if this is um, sort of seeing 30 years of Supreme Court precedent and saying, well, you know, we, if we wanna run a disciplined campaign on this, uh, we need to keep the record clean, right? We, we can't use, you know, overt attacks on Catholics, claims, things like that. Uh, you know, an interesting parallel of that is uh, California, you know, many times does this thing where they try to repeal the, uh, 
repeal or in some way evade uh, the constitutional amendment that bars uh, racial racial preference. So California, sort of surprising to many people, has a constitutional bar on racial preferences. Uh, and this is particularly important for you think, you know, uh, the University of California. It's a big deal that California has a ban on racial preferences. And so, um, you know, earlier, earlier campaigns or the initial campaign against this is pretty clearly um, sort of pro-racial preference that doesn't quite work. And so uh, the later the later campaigns are much quieter about that, right? They they sort of say, well, you know, this is about this is about equity, whatever that is, or this is about you know giving the government the tools it needs to help all Californians. Um, and so uh, people, I mean, there is always this interplay between uh, particularly ballot initiative politics, uh, when, you know, legislative by ballot initiative, and court decisions. And so, um, you know, you, you, you have a better record in 2000, but I'm not convinced that it evinces uh, a change in the cultural impulses that lead to the 1970 amendment. Uh, a few audience members have kindly provided us the panel. Looks like that's Straunch, Bush, and Murphy uh, were the panel for that. So thank you for sending that into the chat. Um, follow up on the um, voucher ballot initiative question. Um, would you say there's a substantial difference between the reauthorization of a law and the failure to repeal a law? Hmm. Would I say that? Um, I, I think there's a pretty, I think there's a pretty big difference because I think that there's always uh, a tendency among voters, if they aren't really sure what's going on, to vote for the status quo. Uh, you see this all the time with uh, taxes. So, you know, I, I imagine different people here come from different places, but I'm, I'm from Cuyahoga County, which is Cleveland. And uh, we all, we are constantly, like every election, we're, we're voting on some sales tax, right? And uh, the marketing is always, this is not a tax increase, right? This is not a tax increase. This is a reauthorization uh, or a, a preservation of, um, you know, the, the existing law. And so, if you had the opportunity, you know, and those usually pass, uh, but I imagine if you had to affirmatively get a repeal of a sales tax, that would be extremely hard, right? You, you would uh, have sort of a higher bar across because, you know, voters, voters are looking at this and they're looking at, you know, there are voters who care a lot about school choice in both directions. There are people who are, you know, really committed to the teacher's union and really don't want school choice. And there are people who have a child they want to send to religious school and really want school choice. And uh, my sense is that, you know, the vast majority of voters don't give this a lot of thought, right? This, this isn't an issue that they uh, really like, you know, are kept up at night about. And so for those voters to affirmatively repeal something uh, that says, you know, we're not gonna give any money to any private school, uh, it seems like a big lift because they're, they're gonna say, well, you know, why would we be giving money to private school? You, you've got to get them through the whole logic of school choice. Uh, whereas if you say, um, you know, we, we just want to reaffirm something. It's like, well, that's been working fine, right? You know, I'm more or less happy uh, with the state of state of play. And so we'll, we'll keep things chugging along. All right, Robert Fitzpatrick um, asks you to elaborate more on the political process doctrine um, and kind of how that might be applied to religious liberty. Sure, um, political process doctrine uh, we know we know um, matters as concerns uh, race, and so uh, in this case, you have a group of parents who are saying Michigan's existing amendment uh, limits our ability to lobby the state government. Um, you know, we we could go in and say, you know, we really want vouchers, or we really want uh, you know some other kind of assistance. We want the the state to in some way. Uh, contribute towards or, you know, give us a tax benefit, whatever, um, towards the education of our students in religious schools. But uh, because this amendment exists, that's sort of a dead letter. Um, so, you know, we're not 
we, we can't engage in the political process in this way. And we can't engage in this political process way in a way that is problematic because we are religious, right? We, we are, um, it is our religious conviction that makes us want this particular uh, political change that makes us want a voucher. And uh, it, it's that, it's the, uh, the amendment precludes us from fully engaging the political process. Now, um, the circuit the court has a chance here to expand that. They have a chance to say, well, you know, we're gonna um, expand this right that we've extended to racial categories, uh, to people of faith, and they don't. Um, and I, I'm sort of surprised by that. I, I guess, you know, they're, they're not on the hook to really go into lengthy explanation. It's sort of the way they uh, explain to say, well, you know, there is precedent that gives, gives uh, this category on the racial classification. There isn't on the religious one. It sort of su suggests to me, and this is, you know, my tea leaf reading, that they may even be a little skeptical of it as concerns uh, the racial category. But, um, you know, they, they do not take up the, the invitation to expand. Um, again, you know, dangerous to make predictions. My sort of long-term prediction is eventually we do see this expanded. Uh, we, we do see a court take this up and expand this religious uh, categories. And um, should that happen, uh, you know, Great, impl great implications for uh, religious liberty. So the first thing we're going to see is more cases can be brought. Uh, if, if courts say, you know, this, this is uh, a thing on which you can lobby, uh, some, some enterprising people could look at a lot of the laws uh, Nicole and I identified and file uh, some lawsuits. So that would be great. Um, sort of as a secondary matter, uh, I, I think that it would put states on notice uh, that they need to um, take more seriously uh, religious liberty claims. So this means that we would expect, you know, I would expect to see uh, more attorney generals issuing advisory opinions saying that, you know, they're not going to enforce various laws, or uh, I would expect legislatures to have a bit more urgency about repealing various religiously discriminatory laws. Um, so I, I think it would catalyze legislative action as well. You mentioned that this case might not be the best vehicle for the Supreme Court to address this question. Um, are there, um, and, and you can, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so you can adjust that statement. Um, are there other cases that people should be watching in this area? Well, this is the thing, right? Nothing's ever the best vehicle for anything in that, you know, I, I could sit here and sort of dream up my uh, ideal plaintiff with my ideal facts. Um, but, but that plaintiff never, never walks in the door, right? And so um, I, I think we should sort of full court press on this as a vehicle. Um, I, I do think the facts are weird, right? There, there are sort of these weird, weird factual things that uh, maybe, maybe obscure the broader, broader uh, societal issues that the court's just going to have to grapple with at some point. Uh, and, and they may think, well, you know, we don't need to do it today. Um, but I think this is a good enough vehicle that they should take it. Right. Otherwise, we wouldn't have filed an amicus brief. Uh, so, I don't know if that that quite answers your question. I guess your other question is like, are there other cases people should be looking at? Um, not, not, not this second. I, I think this is the best vehicle. You know, the best vehicle for the next couple terms is probably this. Um, and I think again, people are probably waiting to see what happens uh, because. You know, to take a family and put them through, take several families, right? This is a bunch of families, and put them through uh, this gauntlet. Um, I think you know, it, 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 many people working in the space tend to be very devout people of faith. I, I don't think I, as an attorney, would want to do this to a family unnecessarily, right? Like, if we can get the law fixed with the current case, we should, uh, and we're always looking to see, uh, you know, the movement's always looking to see 
which cases should be brought next, but um, do, do you need to do all this work again if this one's gonna, gonna fix the problem? Um, probably not. Thank you for clarifying my imprecise statement. Um, no, I mean, it was, it was more precise, honestly, than my answer, so good job. <laughs> Um, one last audience question here. Um, how have conservative jurists typically viewed the political process doctrine? Um, and what does that suggest about possible Supreme Court review? Yeah, I think that uh, I, I think that there's there's mixed jurisprudence on this. Um, I think like many things, um, and and this feels a little, a little uh, gross to some of us as federalists because we, we really like to say, you know, we, we, we look at what the law says and not what it should be and we, we apply it, um, you know, with precision. Um, many of the things that were once instruments of the left have now become instruments of the right. And so, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't think there is a strong reason to just get rid of a uh, political process. Therefore, um, folks on the right should use it now that it is a tool that they can use, uh, particularly for people uh, of faith. And I know that's you know not maybe an unfair gloss to conflate people of faith and people on the right, but it does seem like the right is doing the heavy lifting mostly on religious liberty. And so um, sort of, rehabilitating uh, political process is something that people of faith are going to use in a number of cases. Um, seems like a good a good thing for the Supreme Court to do. Um, that says we've, we've seen we've seen a very cautious court that doesn't like uh, sort of maximalist changes. Uh, you know, there's obviously commentary commentary that uh, on the left that disagrees with that, but I think the way they the way they decide tends to be very narrow and creating big new um, big new areas for litigation is not something they really seem to be in the business of doing. So um, you know, I, I guess I think if if they take this case, they may not go to they may not they may not take an expansionist, you know, the expansionist view, I imagine, on that issue. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it weighs that heavily. I'm not sure the fact that that's contained in here weighs that heavily for or against cert. All right. Well, I want to be mindful of people's time. Um, but on behalf of the Federalist Society, thank you so much for the benefit of your expertise today. This has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, I also want to thank the audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. And please check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned.